be to Allah All praise to Allah There is no God but Allah Allah is great Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to a further episode in the series True Peace, The Secret of Life. We are now doing our third program today, inshallah, and we will complete this section and then move on to a whole new section, inshallah, in the series. Last time we spoke about prophethood and how if you want to find true peace in this life, you have to accept that the Prophet Muhammad sallam, along with all the other prophets, were sent with the exact same message, that all the prophets were human beings. They weren't some other creation or some other creatures. They were human beings just like you and I, who were selected from mankind to be the best of people, to give the message to all of humanity. And they spoke according to the revelation that was given to them by the angels. Remember, we also looked at angels, the task of an angel, how they're different in Islam compared to other religions where angels seem to almost have human-like qualities that they're able to choose between right and wrong. Angels are not born like we are with free will. We also looked at how prophets were chosen as messengers of Allah by the means of giving an example to us on how to live our lives. We want to emulate them. Maybe you're watching this program and you are a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist or an atheist or an agnostic, and you've always wondered, well, why do Muslims dress the way they do? Why do we dress the way we do? Well, it's because we want to emulate our role models, and our role models are the prophets. Our role models are not sports celebrities. Our role models are not film stars, because they will let us down eventually. We will find something about them that will disappoint us, something that will make us turn our back on them and stop supporting them. But the prophets are different, because they are people who have lived a life that we want to emulate, that we want to copy, that we want to be like. We also explained last week that they are explainers of the book, the text that they bought, the book that these prophets gave us. They were not only living examples of that book, but were explainers of that book. Sometimes when we read through the New Testament, we'll find that the Jesus, peace be upon him, would say something, and straight afterwards it would say, and they did not understand him. And then he would explain it to the people. So first they do not understand, and then he would explain it. And the same we would find throughout history with different prophets. Whenever they would give a message to the people, many did not understand, and therefore they had to be explained. The prophets were explainers to the people. They were teachers. They were rightly guided teachers. So they weren't teaching a new philosophy or a new style for the day, but they were teaching what Allah had given them to teach mankind. Today we have many people who are self-made philosophers and they come up with their own philosophy. Well, this was not the way of the prophets. The prophets could do that, but they didn't do that. That's the difference. They were able to do that, but they didn't. They listened with obedience. And this is something that we should look at as well as young people, as middle-aged people, even if you're in your golden years is that we must be teachers who teach from the Quran, they teach from the Hadith, and don't give our own clever spin on things. We must be textually bound. Many people criticize us sometimes, and they say that you are too staunch, you are too caught in the text. That should be a compliment to us. We shouldn't be afraid of it and try to innovate. We must be people who are confined to the text. If somebody asks, what is your opinion on marriage. You should answer, I don't have an opinion on marriage, but I can tell you what the Quran says. I can tell you what the Hadith says. So we don't have those type of opinions that we often see in many other societies in the world where we find the religions failing. Another important thing about prophets is they were not only giving a message, but they're also giving legislation. You know when a new law is put into effect in your country, they will have elections, they will have referendums, they will do all these things to pass in a new law, to bring in a new legislation, to bring in new judgments into the legal system. The prophets were doing exactly the same thing. They were able to dispensate, to give out new laws or new regulations as Allah saw fit through these messengers. So you might find that 
a certain group of people started to deviate from what Allah had simply given them to understand or to do. And so the next messenger would bring in legislation, laws or rules, bringing those people back to the same guidance that he gave to that prophet before. Now some people misunderstand this and they believe that a prophet will come and he will overthrow the previous prophet's teachings. This is not the way of Allah. We find that Allah is constant. He doesn't change. We have mood changes. We change our minds all the time. Uh, we like blue this week and next week we like purple. Uh, we find that Allah is constant. He is bound to remain constant because it is in his nature. He's not like a human where we have frickle nature that changes all the time. So you'll find if he banned the eating of pork, we don't find that law changing anywhere along the line. It will remain constant. Even the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him himself, attests to this in the New Testament where he says, I have not come to change the law, but to fulfill it. Many people have misunderstood that and said, well, the law was fulfilled when the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, was crucified on the cross. Well, the answer to that will be dealt with in another series called The Cross Question. So I'm not going to spoil it for you and go into that now. But if you come and listen to that series, it will also be on Peace TV, inshallah. You'll be able to find the answer to that question. So the prophets were all messengers. They were final warners to the people. We can look at all the prophets and we'll see that the bucks stopped with them. They were people who were come to tell the people of warnings, to be prepared, to be careful, how to make sure that they can receive salvation. Sometimes that word salvation, people get a bit scared of that but it means to be put into safety. That's all that salvation simply means. Imagine that your boat is capsized and you're in the middle of the ocean and somebody throws you a life raft and you say, well, I don't want salvation. That would be silly. Of course you want salvation. As Muslims, we believe in salvation. We believe in the grace of Allah. Like we've said many times before, Allah says 72 times in the Quran, possibly even more if we look at it in more depth, that he is off forgiving most merciful. Therefore, he wants to have people come into the safety that he has prepared and placed for them to get into, that safety net, that life raft that he has for each one of us. Now, that life raft can be found very easily for each one of us, perhaps that are sitting at home, perhaps you're watching this live on TV right now, or maybe you watching it on one of the social networks, or even downloaded it from one of the websites. If you're watching this now, we get our guidance not from our thumb, not from clever guessing, not from Google, but we get it from the books. And these books are books that were sent by Allah. It is a direction to all of humankind on how to live. And all this on how to live is found in the books. Allah has sent different books over the period of time that human beings have been on this planet. Just like you, if you want to get your driver's license, you have to study a book. You can't just go in and write your exam and immediately be given a license to drive a car. Even before they put you behind the wheel of the car and you learn to drive the vehicle, you first have to go to the book. Once you've studied the book and you've learned all the hundreds, in some countries thousands of road signs, and you get 95% or 98% in my country, you have to get 98% on that exam. Otherwise, they don't even allow you to go and learn how to drive the car. So you can't go to someone and they will go teach you how to drive until you have attained a 98%. In the same way, this life that we live in, we have been given a book, or in fact, we've been given books that we need to read so that we can learn how to live this life. Once we've learned how, we implement that into our lives where we do our driver's test. And then when we have finished that, we get our license. And the license allows you access to paradise. You have to be very cautious of what we say because some people in the world believe that when you get that license, it somehow means automatic entry into paradise. This is not the case. Every person is judged according to the intention. So if your intention is just to get that license, to get a free ticket to paradise, then I'm sorry to say that you are misguided. We have to trust in Allah for everything. We do not assume or try to claim or try to force Allah into a contract with ourselves. We are the ones dependent upon Allah, not the other way around. Remember, like I said to you before in previous series, that if the entire humanity decided to all pray and worship Allah, Allah will remain the same. He is unchanged. 
If the whole of humanity and every creature on the planet stopped praying to Allah, he does not get small or diminish or disappear into nothingness, like we see in some of the old religions like the Greek mythologies and other religions like that. When the people stopped worshipping their God, what happened? Their gods died, or they ceased to be because they fed off the prayers of the people. This is not the case with our God, with the one true God, with Allah, God. He is constant. He is not affected by our changes within our own character or our own temperance. He remains constant. So Allah, the creator of everything, has sent us guidance. And the guidance is in the form of books. And these books tell us the importance of life. Remember, we're talking about how to find true peace. And so these books help us to understand true importance. What is really important? Often what we think is important is not important. You know, when you're in school, the most important thing is to graduate from school. When you're in university, the most important thing is to get a job. When you got a job, the most important thing is to worry about if you've got enough money for when you retire. And when you retire, the most important thing you worry about is if you're going to have enough to leave for your family or those who are going to be left behind. Importance changes. Well, the significance of the Quran, the importance of that, is far more important than these trivial things that we deal with in our day-to-day -day life. The significance of the Quran is so important for us to understand. And inshallah, we'll deal with this a little bit more after we get back from the break. But now it's time for us to take a break. And after the break, I'll speak to you again, inshallah. All praise to Allah. Evil is approaching, is approaching, is approaching, is approaching. A gap has appeared in the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, like this. This is part of a hadith that was spoken over 1400 years ago. And if it was near then, imagine, imagine how near how it is near. now. My name is Muhammad Tim Humble, and in this series we explore the hadith of Sahih Muslim that speak of the trials and tribulations that are to come in the end of days. The end of days. Know and understand the signs of the final day to increase your taqwa and protect your iman in end of days. Next on Peace TV. Praise to Allah. As alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. We are dealing with the series on looking at how we can find peace in life, true peace, not trivial peace, but true peace. And we've been looking at the significance of the Quran before the break, and we were saying one of the significant aspects of the Quran is that it deals with important aspects of life. The second is that there is not a single changed word in the Quran. The words that we found that the Prophet Muhammad may Allah be pleased with him, spoke back then are the same words that we read today. Whether you're reading it in Taiwan, whether you're reading it in Malaysia, whether you're reading it in Japan, the same text is available for all of mankind. That whether you put it in a time machine and take it forward 500 years from now or take it back 500 years from now, it's the same text. Nothing has changed. We don't find this with other texts. We don't even find this with your history books that you find in your local library. You'll see in the front of it, we'll say revised in 1992, revised in 2001, revised in 2013. You'll see they are constantly revising things. You won't find that with the Quran. It's the same book that has remained exactly the same. There are no revisions. There's no revised, revised standard version, the amplified version, living version. There's just one version, and that is the truth that came from Allah to mankind. It remained constant. The entire Quran is for mankind. It's giving us guidance and direction on how we can get as fast as possible to salvation. 
Remember we spoke about salvation being like a lifeline, not as some people understand the word salvation, but understanding it that it gives us the quickest route, the fastest way possible to being in a safe place. So the Quran does not go into storytelling and tell you what the flowers look like and what birds were flying around and what the smell of the roses smelt like. No, it tells you the quickest route, like you get your GPS and you plan a route where you want to go and you put your coordinates in, you press a button and that voice tells you where to go. Again, this is unlike any other text. Whether you're reading the Gita or whether you're reading the New Testament or the Old Testament or whatever book you might be reading, you find many of them are flowery and long-winded and go into great detail because these are written by humans with a human mind, with human thinking involved. This is not what you'll find in the Quran. The Quran is very, very straightforward and to the point, and it is guidance for the entire mankind. So it's not a book dealing with other things that have got nothing to do with mankind. It's specifically written, dedicated to mankind. It is also a medicine for mankind. You know, often we forget this, even as born Muslims, even though you may have been a Muslim for many years, we forget that the Quran is medicine. Take this medicine every single day. They say prevention is better than cure. You know, when you go visit people in the hospital and you sit there and you read to them the Quran, you see the change in them. Even when we read the Quran out loud and you might have pets in your home, maybe there's a cat there or maybe there's a bird or whatever it is, you find that everything calms down. There's a peace that comes over everything. There's a medicine in this Quran. It challenges humanity to think about things. It doesn't tell humanity, stop thinking and just believe blindly. It says the exact opposite. It challenges people to produce a works like it. It challenges people to think of what you actually are prioritizing in your life. It challenges people to ask the fundamental question is, what is my purpose? My purpose is not to make as much money as possible. There's nothing wrong with making money, but that is not your main purpose in life. It gives you meaning for life. What is my meaning? What am I here for? Is this just a waiting room or is there something more that I'm supposed to be doing while I'm here on the earth? It also helps you become a better person. The Quran uplifts you and teaches you how to preserve yourself. Not like pickling yourself, like you would take onions and you would put them in a bottle and pickle them and you do nothing. You know how to preserve yourself as in protecting yourself, preserving yourself from the dangers around you. It warns you of pitfalls that are going to come in this life. And it is the completion of your deen if you follow it according to what the ayahs in the Quran teach you. If you don't follow it, then you won't follow the deen properly. The deen is the way that we live our lives as Muslims. You cannot just speak about being a Muslim. You have to follow it through. You have to be active if you believe in Allah. It's not a passive sport. It's not a passive belief. It's not a passive activity where you sit back and you just think, okay, I believe in Allah, that's all I need to do. It's something you have to put into action. And this is where the deen of Islam is so important. That we have to live the life, not just think about it or talk about it. The other aspect that leads to true peace, to true success in this life, how to find true peace and success in life, is explained by the belief that there is going to be a day of decision, a day of reckoning, as some people like to say, a day of judgment, a day of accounting. At the end of every month, you get all your accounts together. You've got to pay these rates. You've got to pay the electricity. You've got to pay water. You've got to pay whatever the, the bills are. There's a day of reckoning every month when you bring all these things together. We are all accountable in this life to Allah. And on the day of reckoning, we will have to give an account for everything we did. There will be a settlement of the books. And so we need to be prepared for this day of decision the day of reckoning. I like to call it the day of decision, but we can call it the day of judgment. If you're living a righteous life and you're following the way that Allah has ordained for you to live, you should have no fear. doesn't mean we become arrogant and somehow believe that we have earned salvation or that we can be sure that we are going to go to heaven like some people do. And in that way, you are being arrogant, almost forcing the hand of Allah. No, we're not saying that. But there needs to be a certain amount of trust and faith that we have and that we are living the life that will be pleasing to Allah. And if we are living in that gray, doubtful area, then it's time for you to become more serious about your religion, more serious about Islam. So there will come to all of us a day of decision. All of creation 
we will have to give an account for what it did. Everything that Allah has created will give an account. There is a need for us to understand that this life that we're living in now is purely a testing ground. It's a training area. If you want to become a professional swimmer or a professional basketball player or a professional hunter or whatever sports or activity you want to do, you didn't just pick up a bow and arrow and become the best archer there was. You had to train. It was difficult. But the more you trained and the more calluses that you got on your hand and the more pains that you got in the muscles on your hand, the better you became with archery, the better you became with your accuracy on what goal you were trying to hit. And so it is with life. The more we train, the more we practice, the more we apply ourselves to the hereafter, the more we will succeed in this test of life, if we are doing it for the right reason. However, if we get distracted and we play around and we mess around and we don't concentrate on what we're going to do, we'll never be any good at archery and we'll never hit the target. So it's all about you making that effort to make in this life, this testing ground, the most effective testing ground that you can possibly have in this life. To make sure that this testing ground that you have, that you apply yourself, that you put it to the best use the other reason for the day of decision is that there needs to be justice in life. Perhaps you go and you rob a bank. The penalty for robbing a bank is different to somebody who is a serial killer and kills people, which is very different to someone who just simply got a parking violation. So there is a need for justice, that there are different punishments for different things that you did wrong. According to Christianity, there is just one judgment. Those who did not believe in Jesus are all going to hell, no matter how good or how bad you are. The same hell for Adolf Hitler to somebody who only broke one law of God. And this is ridiculous. And the same thing we find is that they will say there's only one reward, whether you're a good from the day you were born and you were a strong believer, to somebody who two minutes before they died became a Christian. They have the same reward. This is not the case in Islam. There are different rewards for different deeds, for good and bad. The day of of decision is also important because this is when the records will be revealed on what you did. Sometimes you won't even know what you invested in. You don't even know the rewards that you'll receive. SubhanAllah, that day when people will surprise, they go, I didn't even know that that small little action, that small little token that I gave to someone would have such a great reward in the hereafter. And the same, I didn't know that one little word that I said would cause so much destruction and cause me so much trouble in the hereafter. And so we see that the day of decision is there to tell us what our rewards are going to be. And for those of you who choose to ignore Allah and choose to reject Allah and say, this is all nonsense, this is all just a fragment of your imagination, you people are weak, you need a crutch, you cripples, you don't know what you're doing, I don't know why even religious people, those of you think that way, well, there's also the alternative. And that decision is going to be one that you're going to re regret for eternity. We rather present you the truth of Islam and let you make that decision on your own. But there is a necessity for there to be a judgment both for good and bad deeds. But there is a way of protecting yourself from entering into the negative, into the hellfire. And that is first to believe that there is a God who cares and wants the best for you. And secondly, that why are you still watching me and why I'm still talking? There is hope for you. The doors of Allah remain open. They have not closed. So this is good news. This is good news for every single human being that is on planet Earth. Jannah is attainable. Paradise is attainable to you. All you have to do is not be passive, but be active. Do something about it today while you still can. Well, this is all the time we have, but tune in again because we are going to be continuing with the series, but we're going to be moving over to education, Islam and education. So it's part of the series. Here we've looked at the very basics today. Next time, inshallah, we'll be moving on to education and Islam. So for me, I read Islam. Till next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم
Glory be to Allah, all praise to Allah. There is no God but Allah, Allah is great. All power and might belong to Allah, the Most High, the Great. Subhanallah. One